Cystic fibrosis was first recognized as a disease in 1938, but it wasn't until 1989 that a team of scientists discovered the cystic fibrosis gene. That same year, a little girl named Mandy Rudd was born with CF. At the time, according to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation Registry, the median age of survival was 29 years old. But with Mandy's life experience and birth story, her parents were told she would be lucky to live to age 18. Research and treatments have progressed, and today Mandy is 31 years old. Her younger sister Natalie was also born with cystic fibrosis, and together they have battled the disease their entire lives. They are now both wives and mothers who are determined to appreciate everything life has to offer. This is All In, an LDS Living podcast where we ask the question, what does it really mean to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? I'm Morgan Jones, and I am honored to have Mandy Sherman and Natalie Moss on the line with me today. Mandy and Natalie, welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Morgan. So happy to be here. This is such a treat for me. I... I watched a documentary and I'm just going to go ahead and put this out there up front. Devin Graham did a documentary about Mandy and Natalie and their experience with cystic fibrosis. And I will be completely honest and say that I have heard of cystic fibrosis my whole life, but I did not really understand what it was or how it affects someone's life. And watching the documentary was so eye-opening to me that I kept making friends sit down and watch. It's like a 20-minute documentary. I'm like, you will sit down and watch the entire thing with me. (laughs) And so... That's really sweet. Yeah. Really sweet. Thank you. (laughs) Well, it's true. I think I watched it at least five times. So oh, I love that. For those those that are not familiar, that are listening to this episode and may be like, what is cystic fibrosis? How would you describe it to someone? Cystic fibrosis is a genetic disease. So it's something that you're born with. And it actually begins at the cellular level, meaning our sodium chloride channels are impaired and they don't function properly. That impairment causes all sorts of chaos over our body. Our bodies do not digest our food. We have to take medication to do so. Our sinuses are affected with chronic sinusitis and frequent surgeries. And the biggest thing that majority of our community suffers with is in the lungs and the lung infection and the loss of lung function. So eventually... Most everybody with cystic fibrosis to continue living will need a double lung transplant. And we all know that, and we kind of just begin preparing for that our whole life and hope that one day we do get those transplants so that we can be here on Earth longer. With cystic fibrosis, our body is already working so hard to fight the disease and breathe every day and just kind of survive and so our immune that leaves our immune system already weaker than a normal person so we are easily able to catch a sickness or a cold and just even a common cold could turn into something really drastic for us and put us in the hospital so we just have to take a lot of extra precautions and make sure that we are extra safe because our immune system is so weak as well Okay. And what plays into when and and how you would receive a double lung transplant? They they have like a little algorithm that kind of they enter in a bunch of different numbers and the the result of those numbers they determine if you would live less than 5 years with your current lung status then that is you know, when they start seeking out transplant. Every CF center has a little bit different requirement for what they want their patients, the status they want their patients to be at to put them on the transplant list. Usually it's about 30% or under in lung function, oxygen use requirements, their quality of life, different things like that. Okay. And one thing that blew my mind on the documentary was it showed how frequently you're receiving treatments or you're treating cystic fibrosis in your daily life. So how would you describe how it affects day-to-day living? 
I'll take that one. So with day-to-day living, it is extremely time consuming and you have to be able to really plan around your CF and your treatments. So it's really hard for somebody with CF to do something spur of the moment or to say, let's go get breakfast and let's go right now. Like that doesn't really happen for us because you really have to schedule out your treatments and live so strictly to that schedule if you want to take the best care of your health that you can. But at the same time as being totally regimented, you also have to be learn to be completely flexible and drop everything on your yes. plate any time to go into the hospital for a two-week hospital admission. So it requires strict routine, but also ultimate flexibility. Wow. So Mandy, your parents first found out that you had CF when you were born. The doctors told your parents that you would likely live to be 18 years old. They encouraged, your parents encouraged you to live your life to the fullest. So my question is, when did they first tell you about that life expectancy? And were you scared? I actually found out that CF was terminal at a cystic fibrosis clinic appointment. And, you know, when you're a kid and, or a teenager, you're just like not really paying attention to what the doctors say and your parents are talking about. And I was 12. I was around 12 at this appointment. And I remember my doctor in a conversation with my parents talking about it being terminal or terminal this, terminal that. And that word stuck out with me and caught my attention. And so I, I immediately cued my ears in to listen and I just felt like first I felt confused and then I felt not me that doesn't make sense not CF I mean yeah I have CF and CF is like an illness but I'm not to die you know I felt that fear and then that denial and then I felt betrayal from my parents like why have you not ever told me about this before why haven't we talked about it and on the way home, I asked my mom that. I said, CF is terminal? Are you really? Are you serious? Like, why haven't we talked about this? And my mom was so quick on her response and casual. She was just like, oh, your dad and I, we opted when we found out that we weren't going to focus on the life expectancy or on death of CF. You know, we were death with CF. We were going to focus on living life, living a good life, Focusing on the positive, finding the positive, and that's just how we viewed CF in our family and CF with your life. And it was such a powerful moment because she gave me a calm and kind response. She wasn't flustered, which allowed me to, you know, think calm and clearly about it. Her answer was so sure and so sounding that it just resonated truth within me. And I immediately felt peace. And knew that what she was saying was true. And all of my feelings of resentment and betrayal and worry literally just melted away within that moment when I was 12 years old. And um, I was like, yeah, I don't need to focus on the life expectancy or that I might die. I want to focus on the life I'm living now and living the best life that I can. Yeah. Natalie, what about you? Do you remember when you first understood that there was a a life expectancy associated with CF? Yeah, so honestly, for me, I don't quite remember when it hit me. This is a terminal illness. I just remember because it's so common in our household growing up. We would just talk about, yeah, CF, the life expectancy is this, but we're going to do this and this and this, and we're going to have fun and we're going to do the best we can. And we're going to be happy about everything. And so it was never really focused on this is the life expectancy and it's a grim outcome and things like that. Like it just wasn't in our household. It was just a positive, happy environment and positive outlook and faith filled outlook. And so there wasn't ever a time that I remember where it hit me, man, I really am not going to live as long as somebody else, you know, but I think just over time with hearing the and talking about it and having so many conversations about it in our family that I just kind of came to the understanding, like, 
yes, this is a terminal illness and I do have it. And this is really what my reality is. But that doesn't mean I have to focus on this because our parents taught us, you know, no regrets. If you want to do this, you go and do it and we will support you 100%. And when that time comes, then that's great. That's Heavenly Father's plan for us. But let's do what we want to do here on earth while we have the energy and while we feel good enough and let's make the best of it. So I don't really remember exactly a specific time. I think it was just over time that I kind of came to that realization. Yeah. Mandy and Natalie, so one thing that I have admired from a distance now for a little while is the sweet relationship that the two of you have. And Mandy, you were only three years old when you learned that Natalie, you would have a little sister and that she would also have CF. You said in the documentary that that was one of the biggest blessings God has given you. What has it meant to you to have someone who understands what you're going through? And then I'd love to hear, I've been curious about how the two of you navigate CF differently and how you admire each other for the way that you've navigated this. So you mentioned that I was three when Natalie was born and that's true. And I, I thought everybody did what I did. I thought everybody took as many pills and treatments and stuff. And so of course my sister was going to do that too, because that's just, the way it is. And so it wasn't until I was older that I realized how lucky I was. You know, I had her as my partner through everything. Somebody who understood, like really understood what a CF stomach ache feels like. Someone who really knows exactly what I'm talking about. When I'm like, oh my God, like I have a plug right here in my lungs and you can feel like a part of your lungs that is blocked off. I, I had that all growing up and I was grateful for it, but I didn't realize the magnitude of how special that was until I was 25 and I met a girl who she, she introduced herself to me and quickly shifted the conversation saying, my little sister has CF and we don't know anybody else. She doesn't know anybody else that has her disease. Would you please talk to her? And I just immediately, my heart went out to her and I was just like, that is so lonely. I couldn't imagine how lonely her path in life had been up until that point. And I was so astoundingly grateful that I didn't have to go that right from the very beginning. God gave me somebody who would be (laughs) by me through the whole process that we could lean on each other and how special that was. And yeah, I definitely say that Natalie is one of the greatest gifts that God could have given me because having somebody to understand and relate to you on such a unique path is really priceless. And I'm so thankful for her. So then Natalie, I'll have you tell me, how do you feel like Mandy approaches CF and a terminal illness differently than you do? And what do you admire about that approach? Mandy navigates a little bit different than I do with her cystic fibrosis, just because she is three years older than me. So she will always have three years on me of the disease progressed. So it's been really helpful to be able to rely on her and lean on her. If I have something that is new to me, for example, if my lungs start bleeding and I'm coughing up blood and I had never had that happen to me before, I can call Mandy and she can tell me, look, this is what you need to do. Do this, this, and this, and this will help you. Another way that she navigates it a little bit differently than I do is that she has more lung infections than I have had or a little bit different infections than I have had. And I have more sinus disease than she does. So we both have a little bit different parts of our CF that are more prominent. So when I have something wrong with my lungs, I can ask her or when she has something wrong with her sinuses, she can ask me and we can help each other out that way. And I had just admire her so much with her daily effort that she puts into doing her treatments. And especially now me being a brand new mom and watching her be a mom and trying and figuring out how to 
find time to take care of your baby and to do your treatments and to eat everything that I need to eat for the day. It's a task. It's real hard. So that is something that I really admire. No matter how many times she goes in for a clean out, which is our two week hospital stay, she always just puts forward her best effort and a positive attitude and she just goes in there and it is what it is. And this is what is going to happen. And I'm going to do the best I can. Yeah. Mandy, would you say anything about the way that Natalie handles it and, and what you admire about that? Particularly right now, we're in the middle of the COVID-19 respiratory pandemic. And Natalie is being so brave. The way that her past laid out for her during this time she has to work in a public location surrounded by hundreds of teenagers being a teacher and I I I just don't think I could do that and Natalie is doing it and she is showing up she's doing everything she can to be safe and to educate her students on germ spreading and that they really really need to be please be careful around her um but man, I am like so scared for her, but she, you know, stands up in, in with her courage and shows up every single day for those kids and for her job. And, you know, clearly Heavenly Father wants her to be there because no other options worked out for her at this time. And I just think she is so brave right now working in a public setting in the middle of a respiratory pandemic, which if we got would be totally devastating for our our health and our life. Yeah. Has, so we mentioned earlier that originally the life expectancy, Mandy, for you was 18 years old. You are how old now? I just turned 31. Hey, oh, we're the same (laughs) age. And so I just wondered, has the prognosis for CF progressed as you've gotten older or how does that work? CF is a progressive degenerative disease. So the longer you have it, essentially, like the stronger it gets, it's a domino effect, right? It starts taking over and, you know, more of your body is scar tissue or damaged. And so, yes, as I have gotten older, my disease has definitely changed, gotten stronger. It's been more prominent in my life. But at the same time, recently, November 2019, so not even a full year ago, um, the FDA just passed a new medication that is life changing. And Natalie and I both had the opportunity to actually be a part of the clinical trial for this medication. And I can say that it was life saving for me. Two years ago, I was actually inpatient at the hospital when I, I finally got to take the drug versus placebo. I ended up having placebo for like all all three stages of the trial, which was very frustrating and very relied on faith with Heavenly Father that he had his hand in that and that it was meant to be. But I finally got the medication and I was in the hospital. I was under a hundred pounds. I was wearing oxygen. I, at that point in time, I was entering in the hospital for two week treatments about every six to eight weeks and my quality of life was so low. And I, I had 32% lung function. And I've been on that medication now um, for two years because of the way the clinical trial timeline has been with the FDA approval. And I, I haven't, I've been hospitalized two times since I got the actual drug. I am exercising. I am not on oxygen. I am, I ran a half marathon in January and it has totally saved my life. I was on the road to transplant. And, you know, my husband was, my husband flat out told me the other day at this point in time, two years ago, he thought that I wouldn't be here. And he thought he would be navigating life alone with our son. And for me to be here and be laughing without coughing and having energy and joining them on like drives around the mountain, like he is so thrilled at what this medication has done and how it has changed my life and ultimately our family. So 
the prognosis, like Mandy said, when we were growing up, it was when we would go to our doctor's appointments, it was a pretty um, grim outlook. Like it was just the doctors, of course, are just here's the facts, blah, blah, blah. You know, here's the facts. And here is what is expected. And throughout the years, as technology has developed, as new medications have come out, it is really cool to see not only the doctor's perspective starting to change, but to be able to experience that in our own lives as well. It's just really honestly been life changing to have that drug and be a part of that trial. And I know that that's why Mandy went to that hospital is because we were both meant to get in the trial and get this drug. And that's the reason why she was led to go to that hospital. I love that because I think so much of the time we're only hearing the negative about all aspects Mm -hmm. of life. And we don't have that inside view into progress that's being made and good things that are happening. And so I appreciate you both sharing that good news. One thing that I have loved about following along with especially Mandy's account, because I was connected with her through a friend, but in in watching the way that the two of you live your life, you really have embraced that perspective that your parents had and what they tried to instill in you that we're going to live our lives and you haven't missed out on on these big things, the things that really matter. And so you both have gotten married and you both have had a baby. And in in the video, Mandy, your husband says, I figured if I could be with her two years or 20 years, I would take it. And then Natalie's husband said something similar and added that he knew he would have eternity with her. So however long he gets in marriage is perfect for him. How do you approach having a terminal illness in dating and then in marriage? So approaching CF in dating and marriage, when we were dating, it was really important to us to be upfront and honest with the person that we were dating because this is the biggest part of our lives and this is us. So take it or leave it pretty much. Like, so even on the first date, we would just drop the bomb on them and be like, hey, look, here it is. Here's a part of me. And, Seriously. you know, yeah. Dating me yeah. was probably extremely overwhelming. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, but on the flip side, you weed people out pretty quickly. Exactly. That's yeah. kind of the beauty of it. No second date. Okay, you're not it. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, we would just always be straight up and honest with them and kind of tell them, look, here's what it is, and this is a part of us. And this is, you know, this is how it is if we want to date or if you want to continue dating or whatever. And, you know, some people couldn't handle it and that's okay because it's a lot to handle. It takes a really, really special person to be able to handle not only our crazy personalities, but our crazy disease as well. And so it really does just take somebody um, really special. And you know, life with CF is just a roller coaster of emotions always. It's, you know, we have a really good high and then we have a dip and then a good high again and a dip. We always joke about in our family, like, you know, you think you know about CF until something happens and then everything you knew previously, it just goes out the door and this is a new problem that we have to face or something new that everything we had prepared for and learned about, it throws us for a loop. And so we always joke about how as much as we know about CF, we really don't know anything. (laughs) And really, like you have to find somebody who is wanting and able to stick with you on the roller coaster ride. And it really does take a special person. And that's why when I found Al, I just held on to him as tight as I could because I knew he was someone special and somebody I wanted to stick by me and ride this crazy ride of life in CF. There's this quote I love, and I really think it describes my husband and CF spouses really spot on. And 
it's something that I think about really often in the hard times and in the easy times as well with me and my husband. And it says, find somebody who chooses to be by your side in the happiest of moments and only presses his feet further in the ground during the moments of struggle and defeat. And I really think that that just explains the roller coaster of CF because there are happy times and he sticks right by my side and there are really hard times and he only digs his feet further into the ground and is right there with me to take on anything that comes our way. And so with CF in marriage, it's really important to just be honest and talk about your feelings and be able to express the good things and the worries and the hard times and the stresses and be able to have that open communication because it really only makes your love go, grow stronger for one another. Thank you. Mandy, anything from you on that? Kind of like Natalie said, I, in dating, I was so open about it. On the first date, I was like, hey, I have this. And you know, I was that way growing up. I was always very open about my cystic fibrosis because mm-hmm. it was the same with friends. You know, some people could handle it and some people couldn't. And I I didn't ever want anybody to think I was keeping a secret from them, you know, if they found out about it later. And it it allows people to weed, weed themselves out, remove themselves on their own terms when they need it. And that's okay. Like Nat said, it's okay because not everybody can handle that. And I respect that. Not everybody can handle cystic fibrosis. And I respect that. When it comes to dating Rick, he and I, we were actually set up on a blind date. And I was going through a divorce when my friend's initially started talking to him about me and we were at the time our friends you know started telling us hey there's this really great girl or there's this really great boy neither of us were interested in dating obviously I was still married I was in the middle of a divorce and over time you know our hearts softened to the idea as I found healing through therapy and connecting with Heavenly Father more than before. When I felt I was ready to date again, I went on dates with other people before because Rick was long distance. He went in a different state. And I just, I don't know, I wasn't ready for serious dating or, you know, really putting in that much effort for a long distance relationship. But obviously, you know, that in the end, it did work out. And one of the things that we laugh about is, my my friends when they were air quote pitching me to Rick, they described me as, Oh, she's so fun, she's so cool, she's athletic and plays volleyball and has a lot of energy and is just really sweet. But she's dying. She has this disease. <laughs> that was like I don't even know if he knew my name, but he knew that I played volleyball, I was in the middle of divorce and I was dying. And he didn't run. He didn't, you know, shove me off to the side. And I just admire him so much because how many people are going through a divorce and think they'll never find love again or feel that they're worthless. And then same thing within our community that people just feel that they are a burden on others, that they don't deserve to be married because they don't want to put their disease or their health issues on somebody else. And I always remind them, like, you are not a burden. You know, you and your disease are not the same. You are you and you have this disease or you have this illness or you have this documentation that you've been married before or you have a kid from a previous marriage, whatever it may be, but you are you and all those things are bonus that comes with you. And there will be somebody who doesn't run. There will be somebody who accepts all of that And not only will they accept that, they will love you for all of those things. And they will love you with all of those things. And I think, you know, it's really hard when you're single or just having a hard time dating or finding people to date. Or we all have crazy challenges in life. And so many of us have a desire to get married. And I just want to say, like, I am a living testament that you could have a lot of things wrong with you or 
baggage, you know, air quotes, and they're still going to be a great person that accepts all of that because they see you for who you are and to not give up and to keep going. Thank you. That's so well said. (laughs) Can I say one more thing real fast? Yeah. So just as me and Mandy are talking, I know that we are encouraging and we're saying, you know, like that if you have a lot of baggage or if you have a lot of things that you carry or like you think you're a burden on other people, please know that that's not to say that we don't struggle with that because both me and Mandy, we still struggle with that. And that is something that we work on daily and constantly. So please don't think that we have mastered that skill of separating this is us and this is our disease. Um, It really is something that you have to work on a lot. And we are not perfect at that by any means. We still struggle greatly with that. But it is something that we try really hard to get better at every day. And it's just baby steps, step by step by step that you work on improving those things and overcoming those in your life. So I just felt like I should add that part. No, and I'm so glad you did because I think that there, that is what the beauty of sharing our experiences is. It's not to say that we've mastered something, but oftentimes when we've experienced it, then we're able to speak to that emotion or that pain because it's like, yeah, I've been there and these are the things that I've prayed about or I've studied about or I've worked at and I'm not there yet, but but I'm I've come a little ways and then I'm able to help other people. And so I think that that is beautiful. Mandy, another thing that I wanted to touch on, you were miraculously able to have a baby and you were encouraged initially to abort the baby due to the amount of risks associated with someone with CF having a child. What played into your decision to to go forward with that pregnancy? And let me just tell everybody on here that Hawk is so adorable. (laughs) <laughs> yes <Thank> he is <laughs> so on behalf of all of us we're so glad you went forward with it but what played into that decision thank you as soon as I found out I was pregnant the first people that Rick and I told were my doctors we knew that what had happened the ability for me to actually conceive was in and of itself a miracle it was going to be a hard road and we needed all hands on deck. What we didn't realize was really how difficult it was, but my doctors realized that. And you're right. We we went in naive being like, we, we're pregnant. Isn't this a miracle? This is so wonderful. Help us move forward with, you know, having this baby. And everybody's initially pretty excited about babies. And that lasted for about two minutes. And then you're right. They encouraged us to terminate and said, this is not good. This will be our job is to keep you alive and keep you healthy. And this thing directly affects both of those. So our professional medical opinion is to, is to abort and it would be in your best interest. Rick and I were so taken back. Initially, you know, our guards threw up and we're like, Oh no, we can't do that. Um, We have strong religious views that that is not what we're supposed to do. And you know, we left. And when I said we want, we needed all hands on deck, that's medically as well as spiritually. We met with our bishop and our state president, you know, just seeking spiritual advice on how to navigate this path and told them what our medical team recommended. And they, they said, well, actually, when it comes to the church's stance, if it's a direct threat to the woman's life, that's, acceptable and you know you can't rely on in this situation you can't say oh my religious standards are a no because you know you are in that unique situation where your life is directly threatened and whatever road you have to take that is between you guys and your heavenly father 
and whatever road you do choose to take, you know, Heavenly Father will direct you and you you won't have shame, you know. And Rick and I were just like, wow, yeah, we do fall into that category. And this is really, really hard. And he and I, we delve right in. I mean, we're praying people anyways, but you're, when you have a situation like this on your hand, your prayers just become way more intense and severe and constant. And your brain is in overdrive trying to think of, um, you know, all the situations and what ifs. And we did lots of pondering and studying of the scriptures. And ultimately, we both came to a decision on our own. And or we both had separate feelings. And then we got together and talked about it. Both of us, we only got one answer. And that was that this baby needed to come to earth. We never got any peace or comfort if the baby was going to live a long life. We never got peace or comfort what was going to happen to my life or what my outcome would be of this situation. And what we didn't mention is that we had been married at this point for three months and we were six weeks pregnant. And so three months into our marriage, we were making this life or death decision. And it was crazy emotionally, crazy spiritually. But what we both knew was that this baby had to come to earth and I had been chosen to bring this vessel to earth. And no matter what the outcome was for my, in regards to my life, if the last thing I ever did was bring this, allow this spirit to have their earthly body, you know, there's no more beautiful gift than I could have, I could have done or could have had. And so that's what we, that's when we knew we had to move forward and, like I said, we never knew what was going to happen to me. The gal that lost her life four months before I did in labor, both her and the baby passed away in delivery. And my pregnancy was so difficult. We had so many complications and hospital stays. Both Hawk and I should have died multiple times during my pregnancy, and we were both saved. And I felt pretty calm and confident during my pregnancy because I knew he had to come to earth. I knew this, this baby had to come. And so I was like, all right, like, this is, this is going to be okay. These are scary moments, but I know it's supposed to happen. Oh, like, we'll make it through this. In delivery was when I was nervous because I knew that that was when the other CF woman had passed away. And uh, I had been talking to my grandfather a lot and I was very close to my grandmother and she had passed away before I had been remarried and I was talking to him and I was so sad that she wasn't going to be a part of this. And I asked him, can I pray for grandma to be with me during the delivery? And he said, absolutely. He encouraged me to pray for whoever I wanted to be there on whatever side of the veil. And I, in that moment, moment I knew what I needed to do and I began praying for all of the ancestors that came before me all the women that gave birth from that I was related to from the time of Adam up until now they gave birth in scary situations unmedicated situations on the plains in a boat wherever they had survived pregnancy and I needed them to help me survive this do this task at hand and then hopefully be able to survive some way and I the room as time went on during my labor the room became increasingly hotter and hotter and hotter and I knew it was because more and more of my female ancestors were showing up to the room to help me do this task to help this spirit child make its way to earth in its earthly body safely and it was one of the most spiritual experiences of my life. I, I knew that my Heavenly Father and my Savior were there. I knew, I felt when their hands took over my body. And it was, it was an almost out-of-body experience. It, all of, I, I turned my body and my life over to the Lord, and I saw and felt him work his miracles through me. And both Hawk and I made it safely through that experience. 
five years later, we're both still here. We're both healthy. And I never felt more beautiful, more connected with my ancestors and the heavenly spirits than in that moment. I felt my heavenly father's love and his arms. And I felt the miracle of childbirth. And I knew that this is what life is about. You know, it's, it's about family. It's about, you know, no matter what your family looks like now or in the future or what it has looked like, Heavenly Father knows your unique family experience, your unique family design, and he has his hand in there and is helping you and will help you along the way. I got full body chills when you were telling that story. So thank you for sharing that. Natalie, you on the flip side were just able to have a baby through surrogacy. What does it mean to you to become a mother? And this is fresh. This is very fresh. It is one month today. I have wanted to be a mom my entire life. Like that has been my dream since I was little. I have just dreamt about it and I've, my heart has wanted that so, so badly. And I just never knew if it was going to be in the cards for me and my family. And after seeing what Mandy went through with her pregnancy and hearing what the doctors had to say and talking with them, me and Al took it to the Lord and we prayed and we fasted so, so much about what we should do. And we came to the personal decision that we were going to do gestational surrogacy. And that is a very personal, individualized decision that somebody needs to make. And we knew that it was the right decision for us. And we knew that because we had multiple undeniable experiences where we saw Heavenly Father saying, this is what your plan is for you, not for everybody, but for you personally. And here is how I'm going to make it happen for you. And it was just truly the most faith building testimony of to me that Heavenly Father has an individualized plan for each of us. None of our plans look the same. And it is your personal decision on how you create and come to bring your family to earth. And me and Al, me and my husband knew that that was part of our plan. And that was our decision that we had come to was to start our family and bring our child to earth through gestational surrogacy. Well, we are so happy for you to be a mom. Thank I just want you. to say that. I just am glad that, that that was able to work out. I think that one thing that I wish, it's, it's kind of like, this is kind of like how sometimes I wish that I was a convert to the church because I think I would appreciate it more. And not that I would ever wish that I would have CF because of what you all have described, but I admire and feel kind of this like holy envy for your ability to value and appreciate the gift of life and the the beauty of our mortal experience, kind of going back to what Mandy said, just like the ability to come to this earth and have our spirits gain a body. And what do you wish that people could understand about valuing and appreciating that gift more? Nobody is guaranteed a certain amount of life. And that is at the forefront of our experience here on earth. And you're right. We have been blessed with that knowledge early on so that we were able to live life intentionally. And not very many people are able to walk that unique path. But I hope that anybody that takes the time to listen to this podcast and learn of our experiences or meet somebody else that might know that they have a shortened lifespan, um, that it changes them and that they 
make the decision to live life intentionally, to be intentional with your time, intentional with your entertainment, intentional with the people that you spend your time with, and to live with no regrets. Natalie mentioned that is our family motto, and we've had that our whole life. And having that motto and knowing that our life could be cut short really at any moment, it allows us to repent of our sins more quickly, seek mending relationships that might have been hurt, search for answers and questions that we might have, take life by the horns and say yes to that experience take that vacation, plan that birthday party, visit that person, talk to your neighbor, talk to your grandma because, or your grandparents, because you don't know when the last time you're going to be able to do those things is. And so seek those opportunities. Don't let anything rest on the shelf to do that later. Really, when you have an opportunity, take it, whether that is mending a relationship or making a trip happen. Thank you, Mandy. Natalie? Yeah, something I wanted to add is that in the general conference that just happened, Elder Bednar said, you know, there are tests in life. And the best way that we can prepare for them is to study and prepare the best we can. And I think that that is something that is really important for all of us. Preparing in hard times and in life might not mean studying this, this, and this. It might mean taking this chance and this opportunity to make this memory. And I think it can be viewed in many different ways because life is a journey and life is not always going to be sunshines and rainbows, you know, like there are some hard things in life. And we just have to remember that each hard thing that we are given is part of our plan that Heavenly Father is giving us. And it's part of our test that he is handing to us and saying, okay, Natalie, tell me how you are going to accomplish this little test today. I want to see if you can do the best that you can, and if you can grow through this experience. And something that I like to think about when times are hard, or just when I'm having a a little bit tougher time, maybe appreciating the moment or appreciating and valuing my life is, I like to think that in heaven, for example, with CF, okay, so with CF, something that came to my mind very clearly one day when I was having a hard time in the hospital and this very clear picture came into my mind and it was in heaven and it was a group of people and it was heavenly father at the head of us. And he was just saying, okay, now on earth, we are going to have this trial. And he said, who wants to volunteer to have the trial of cystic fibrosis on earth? And I remember I stood up and I said, me, me, I will take that trial of having cystic fibrosis on earth and I will do it and I will be so happy to do it and I will do the best I can. And I think that that is just a clear testament that we each have our own trial and each hard thing. And even though our earthly mind and our earthly bodies might not be able to comprehend that, If you have the eternal perspective, you are able to appreciate each moment and each experience that much more. You just have to really, really focus and practice on having the eternal perspective and constantly training your mind to focus on the positive and enjoying every moment and learning something from the hard moments, not just enduring them but and pushing through them, but taking that and using that to learn something and better yourself for the next time. And I think that by doing that and preparing ourselves for the ultimate test of returning back to Heavenly Father, that there are just so many things that we can learn here on earth and through our lives that can help us be able to focus on the positive and grow into that Christ-like human that we all 
long to be. So um, I think that that is something that people in general and us in hard times can focus on is just keeping that eternal perspective and being able to know that we each have this hard time or this experience in life for a reason. Everything we have is for a reason. And so let's take it and let's think about it. And what are we going to learn from this to improve and better ourselves? I don't Thank know if that you makes so sense. Much. No, it makes perfect sense. And I think it reminds me, I was just rereading one of my very favorite talks last night, which is in the book at the pulpit. And it's by this lady named Francine Binion called The Theology of Suffering. And in it, she talks about how there are a lot of different theologies and doctrines from different religions about where suffering comes from. And she talks about how in our church, we believe that in in the council in heaven, two plans were presented. One was Satan's plan and one was our Heavenly Father's plan. And our Heavenly Father's plan revolved around agency and it also included suffering. And that, that, that we chose that, we willingly chose it. And I just think that when we think about it that way, it puts everything, like you said, in this perspective of this is what I signed up for. And I don't know how all of that worked in heaven. I don't know, yeah. maybe it was exactly like you described Natalie, but I think that that's a beautiful way of looking at life. My last question for both of you is what does it mean to you to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? What it means to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ is to allow God and Jesus Christ to touch all aspects of my life. Keep them involved in everything I do, not just in gospel and church, but with health, with work, with travel, exercise recreation, school, everything I have, I have has been given to me through them. Remembering that and including them in everything is what it means to be all in. To be all in, in the gospel of Jesus Christ means to me that each day you purposefully put on Christ's jersey and you make that decision every day that you are going to do the best you can you're going to have a positive attitude and you are going to take each moment and learn from it to better yourself. Two thumbs up. Okay. Mandy only gives you one thumb up, but I give you two. <laughs> I had two. Both of our responses was an automatic thumbs up, though. So. That's a good sign. All right, guys. Thank you both so, so much. No, thank you. Like I said, I'm like your number one fan. I've listened to every episode. So. <laughs> we are so grateful to Mandy Sherman and Natalie Moss for joining us on today's episode. Be sure to check out the incredible documentary created by fellow Latter-day Saint Devin Graham, all about Mandy and Natalie and their journey. We'll link that in our show notes. You can also find links to Mandy and Natalie's Instagram accounts and follow along with them there. They are both so inspiring and I highly recommend it. So check out ldsliving.com slash all in for all of those links. Thanks to Derek Campbell from Mix It Six Studios for his help with this episode and thank you for listening.